love that. <laughs> I'm standing in the back thinking, Lord, if that were truly the cry of our heart, that we want nothing else, can you even imagine the difference? Can you even imagine the world we might live in? How we might walk through this life. God is just so good. He's just so good. And, and as I've um, listened to everyone who's taken the platform today, from the songs to Sherry to uh, Cheyenne and even the things that Pastor Ronnie, the word's already gone forth. The truth's already been released. Um, God is already speaking to us. And I'm so grateful that we have a God who speaks to us. I just, I don't know how, I don't know how to do life without God speaking. I don't know how to do this without God being God in my life. So we're going to press into week two of being positioned for transition. This is something that has been on our pastor's heart. And it's something that the Lord has really sown into my spirit. And I believe that it's uh, with great purpose for this time. So if you would stand with me, we are going to read a passage of Scripture. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left the oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and he slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his attendant. Father, I thank you for the way that you lay things out for us in the Word. Father, if we will just seek you, your Word says that we will find you. And Father, that is consistent in your Word, Father. If we seek you, Lord, if we have questions, if we need an example, if we need to be led, your Word is a lamp unto our feet, and it is a light unto our path. And Father, we can go to your Word, and we can find direction. We can find life. We can find hope. So I pray, Father, today that all of those things be um, rich within this teaching, within this message. I pray, Father, that all of my stuff would be forgotten and yours would stand and produce fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Last week, we talked about the positioning of the arrow, and we're going to talk about that a little bit today. We're going to lace this in with another direction for transition that I believe the Lord has placed on my heart. And I believe that he has given us such a good example of how to do these things, how to make transitions in our walk and how to make transitions um, across the board. I believe that um, we are called to make meaningful transition. I think that the Lord shows us how to do this. And I think he gives us example because I think how we enter into a position and how we leave that position matters to God. I believe when the Lord gives us a place to stand, when he puts a mantle on our shoulders, when he gives us authority or he, like I said, places the mantle on us, it's not your mantle forever. It's not yours forever, and one of the, the most important things we can do is to understand that the mantle must continue. I think we, um, one of the things the Lord dropped in my spirit was that every transition requires an evolution. Every transition requires an evolution. It isn't, transition takes time. And there's a way that we evolve into it. To evolve means to become better or more equipped and move into a more advanced state. I believe the Lord allows an evolution into things just as he allows an evolution out of things. And I think one of the best examples that we have of that is 
generational exchange. Generational exchange, uh, and I don't know that we do a great job with that. I can just hear Pastor Wayne <laughs> sitting in the living room right now going, it's called discipleship, and it is. And we have somewhere lost the heart to do that. Somewhere along the way, we have lost the desire to invite others to to find the secrets of the mantle that we carry. When, when the Lord anoints someone and blesses them and covers them and gives them this anointing, somehow it seems that we've gotten to the place where we keep the mantle closed. And I don't know if it's because we're afraid we're going to lose our position or we're afraid we're gonna, if we share what we know, then, then maybe they'll come and take our place. They're supposed to. They're supposed to. There should be generational transition taking place. Otherwise, we are not fulfilling the gospel. We're supposed to be advancing the kingdom. And I understand the desire to grow the kingdom. Everybody wants a big church with a lot of people. But if that church with a lot of people is staying in the same place and they're not doing anything to advance the kingdom of God, you can become a stagnant pool very fast. And so I believe one of the things that the Lord is birthing, even more so in this body at this time, is a generational release and as a, a call to discipleship within the body so that the next generation is equipped for the call that God has placed on them. And so as I begin to study and as I begin to pray about this, I said, Lord, I need you to show me how we walk this out. And the passage of Scripture he took me to was about Elijah and Elisha. And I love their story. I love their story. And we catch glimpses of their story, you know, and, and make them sound like they are just the most amazing men. And how could prophets that performed miracles? And, and they were flesh and blood and walked the earth. And the example that they said, I think, is relevant to where we are uh, as a body at this time. And so I just want to share this with you a little bit. The first time that we see the names Elijah and Elisha linked together, Elijah's having a bad day. Elijah has run from Jezebel, and he has been hiding, and um, he has been, uh, the Lord just basically had to feed him and get him on his feet again. And the Lord begins to speak to Elijah, and Elijah begins to pour out his heart and tell him all of the things that are, that are, that are, are going on in his life. And, and I know that the Lord heard him, and, and what Elijah said was important, but when the Lord speaks, it was almost as if he was going, okay, yeah, yeah, I know this. Now, Elijah, get up, go back the way you came. And he gives him instruction to go and anoint two separate kings to take care of two separate pro problems. And then he says, I want you to go and I want you to anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, to become your successor. People in position do not like the word successor very often because that is the clue that your tenure will one day come to an end. And can I tell you, if your tenure comes to an end and you don't have a successor, you haven't done your job well. Because God, the work of the kingdom continues. It's supposed to. Until he comes back, our hearts need to be about who's next instead of this is mine. And we see this with Elijah and Elisha. There are a couple of things. You know, the first thing we find out about Elisha is that he is plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself is driving or is working the, the 12th plow. This tells me, now I'm a farmer's girl. I grew up on a farm, and I know that when you plow a field, you stagger the oxen. You don't put them eye to eye because if you do, this, this yoke will start trying to move toward this one, and this one will move toward that. They're very easily, they, they pull together. And so what you do is you send one yoke, wait a few minutes, you send the next, wait a few minutes, you send the next. And what happens a lot of times, the person who drives the 12th yoke of oxen is the low man on the totem pole <laughs> because that's where all the dust is going. That's where the dirt is going is this going back to the 12th oxen as you plow this dry field. And so the first thing that we see is that Elisha was a servant 
Now, I say that because of this. So often we assume, well, then he must have been the low man on the totem pole. But what we find is that there's no way he could have been the low man on the totem pole. But he couldn't have been a servant. He had to own the field. How do I know this? Because the word tells us that after the calling of Elijah, Elisha goes and he burns the yoke, he slaughters the oxen, and he gives the food to the people. He would never have had the authority to do that. He would have never been able to go and and burn someone else's yoke and slaughter their their oxen and feed it to the people, nor would he have had the heart to do so. So when we see Elisha plowing this field, what we see is servant leadership. What we see is a man who could have been first, but chose to be last. What we see is a man in a right position for transition. And so we see this. That's the first thing we know about the one who's coming next is that he has a servant's heart. And that's so important, guys. When the Lord is is, uh, giving you that direction, that the person has a servant's heart, the very first thing Elijah did was get a word. You need a word about who's going to be next. And the obedience in that is once you know, then go do it. Once you know who's next, Go do it. I don't see anywhere where Elijah went, well, God, uh, I've heard things about Elisha, you know, or who is this Elisha? And I have a, a lot of years left. I've got a lot of time to do that. When you get a word from God, your proper response is obedience to the word that God has given you. If you want to advance the kingdom, when the Lord speaks to you, step forward and do what he tells you to do. And that's what we see him do. And I just love this. We know now that Elisha has a servant's heart. And this part tickles me. I can just imagine this. You know, Elisha's in the field, and he's been plowing all day, and he's been with the 12, you know, at the 12th yoke. And so he is probably, like, covered with dirt. He is probably a mess. You know what that tells me? That tells me you don't have to get cleaned up for God to call you. You don't have to be in pristine condition to be used by God. It also tells me that the last will be first. And so I can just imagine Elisha in this field, and he looks and he sees a man coming. He had to know it was Elijah. He had to know it was Elijah. And the reason I say this is because even the king knew Elijah, and he knew him by what he looked like, because there's a point in Scripture where um, his, uh, I think it's Jehoshaphat, his servants come and say, well, you know, this man said you were going to die, and the king said, who said I'm going to die? And he said, well, he was wearing a fur cloak, and he had leather straps, and, and he went, oh, that was Elijah. You become known by the mantle that you carry to those in high position and those in low positions. Whatever it is, whatever God has called you to, whatever he has dressed you in, I want you to know that your reputation is going to become tied to that. So it's very important how you carry it. It's very important how you wear it. It's very important that we live worthy of the calling, worthy of the mantle that God has placed on us. Not that we would ever become perfect, but that we would always be dependent upon the Lord to correct us in the times that we need to and then to be quick to obey that. So here comes Elijah, and I'm thinking, I know, I just, I don't know, somewhere in my spirit, I just know that Elisha sees him coming. And it doesn't say that Elijah ran across the field. It doesn't say that he, you know, worked his way to Elisha. The first thing we hear is that He says he goes and he throws his cloak around Elisha's shoulders. Now, I've seen and I've heard teaching that says, you know, he took his cloak off and he gave it to Elisha. But I don't think that's what Scripture shows us. 
See, one thing, this cloak, this cloak, this mantle that Elijah was wearing, it was called an otteroth, and it is a prophet's cloak. And they talk about it repeatedly in the Word, and it's a prophet's cloak, and I don't think he's going to give it away, but the prophet's cloak is doubly wide. It's bigger than the other cloaks. It's bigger than the cloaks worn by kings. It's it's wider. It's weightier. And... um, And when they say it had a belt, it's not talking about, you know, a fashion belt. No, it had belts because it was heavy and it was weighty. And I want you to know your mantle will be heavy and it will be weighty, but your yoke will be light. (laughs) This mantle that he wore had, according to everything I've studied and seen, it would have had crisscrosses across his chest, across his chest, X, to carry the weight of the mantle. And it would have taken more than a moment to remove that mantle, take it to Elijah, Elisha and throw it around his shoulders. And the picture that is presented in the word is that he walks up and he spreads wide that mantle and he throws it around the shoulders of Elisha. And now <laughs> I'm just visual enough to think about the fact that when that happened, with Elisha knowing the anointing that was carried by Elijah, I believe when he opened that cloak and he put it around Elisha's shoulders, I think for a moment Elisha just saw it. Because it doesn't tell us that Elijah said anything. You know what? Anointing needs no words. Because I believe that when that cloak went around him, I believe there was something that went into the spirit of Elisha that just reverberated within him as the call was placed around his shoulders. What we see next is that he goes to run after Elijah. He goes to run after him, and that's the scripture that we read. And, and he says, can I go back, and, and I want to tell my mother and father, I want to kiss them goodbye. And, and, and Elijah says, you know, what have I done to you? I really think that was something that Elisha was supposed to ponder <laughs> in that moment. What have I done to you? And so he goes back. He tells his mother and father goodbye, and He slaughters the, uh, he burns the yoke, and I believe he slaughters the meat, and he passes it out. Guys, the, the casting of the mantle around the shoulders of Elisha was completely prophetic. And I also believe that Elisha making the decision to go back and, and, and let his past go, even forgetting the things that he loved and burning the yoke that he had been under his, his mode of um, provision, the things that had sustained him to that moment, he burned them, he let them go. That was saying, I'm not going back to this. I'm no longer going to need these things because God has called me forward. And then I love, I think it's such a prophetic act for him to slaughter the oxen and care enough to disperse it among the people. That's the heart of servant leadership. And he had it. Now, Now, this part tickles me a little bit because he has received the calling of a prophet. I am going to be a prophet. And so what we find is that he goes and he holds his first conference. No, no. What we find, Scripture tells us that he went and he attended. He attended to Elijah. It doesn't say he became his sidekick. It doesn't say he became known as the assistant regional manager. It doesn't say any of those things. His notoriety was not in that. What he did was he went and he attended and he ministered to Elijah. That servant heart that he carried allowed him to go, yeah, one day this, but right now this is where God has me. And God had him there for almost eight years. Sometimes when we think we have a calling from God and we enter into a church situation and we give them eight months to recognize how talented we are, and then we go and find another man of God who might recognize the gifts that are in us. We don't have any concept of what it means anymore to wait and to learn and to minister and to attend. Attending means just what it says, be there. 
Be there and wait upon. Be there and wait upon for almost eight years, knowing the calling that God had placed on him. But here's the wonderful thing is that he wasn't doing it grudgingly. He wasn't doing it because, oh, I get that position next. He was doing it because of that servant heart that was in him. And he wanted, he wanted to learn the lessons of the mantle. He wanted to see how this works. He wanted to walk in that place that God had called him to with authority. He wanted to to walk in it in the right way. You know, one of the things that I absolutely love is that there comes a time in Scripture where the king is wanting a prophet to speak a word. And he says, do you know a prophet that can come and speak to us? And his attendant tells him, well... There's Elisha. He's the one that poured water on the hands of Elijah. His first notoriety was as a servant. The first thing that people recognized about him was that he served Elijah. He poured water on his hands. I love that. They didn't say, he is so anointed and he hears from God. They went, no, he used to pour water on his hands. Oh, that we would be known for the way we serve, for hearts that do what God has called us to do without desire for position, but with every commitment to fulfilling the calling that God has placed upon our lives. Like I said, for seven years, almost eight years, he did this. And then the time comes, and it's almost time for Elijah to be taken away. And I love this exchange because Three times, Elijah tells him, stay here when I go over here. And Elisha says, as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. And he goes with him. The next time, he says, now, Elijah, Elisha, I've got to go here. And Elisha says again, as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. And then a third time, you know, and what's interesting is every single time there are prophets in those lands, prophets in the places that they've gone. And each time they say, you know, the Lord, that God is going to take your your leader away from you today. He's going to take Elijah away from you today. And depending on the translation that you want to read, each time Elisha says, be quiet be quiet. He didn't want to hear it. That tells me he was not looking forward to this. He wasn't going, I want him to go so I can wear the mantle. He's going, stop it. Some of them say, shut up and stay here. I don't want to hear it. The third time, Elijah Elijah says, stay. And Elijah says, as the Lord lives and, and you live, I will not leave you. And then Elijah says, what would you have me do for you? And Elisha says, I want a double portion of your spirit. And see, to me, I want to be, I, what I hear in this is, I love what you carry so much. I love who you are so much that I want twice of that amazing spirit that you have. I really do not believe for one minute that Elisha went, I want to do more than you. I believe he was going, this spirit that you carry, I just want more of that. I want more of that, of what you carry. Because Elisha hadn't just served Elijah, he had come to love Elijah. He loved him. And we see this played out so beautifully when the time does come and the chariots come to take Elijah. What we hear from the mouth of Elisha is, Father, oh, Father, And then it says he was no more. And then it says Elisha tore his cloak, tore his raiment, ripped his clothes, reached down and grabbed the mantle of Elijah. He wasn't going to touch it until he mourned, until he grieved, until he showed my father has moved on. My father has gone. That's the transition into and out of a mantle. That's how you do this. And and I said all of that to tell you this. This is what I've seen. This 
This is what I have seen as I have walked these last years with Pastor Ronnie and with Pastor Kevin, and, and I'm in no way calling them Elijah and Elisha, and that, would, that, that is so far from their hearts that I would do that. But this is the example that I have seen. I have watched Kevin, I have watched Pastor Kevin follow and follow and follow and love this man of God that he has served under. I have watched the way that he has honored him. I have watched the way that not just him, Pastor Margaret and their family, I have watched the engagement level with Pastor Kevin. God so ordained this. God so set this up. He gave Pastor Ronnie another son. <laughs> he, has, he is a son in the faith, and I have watched Pastor Ronnie open that mantle wide and, and welcome him and, and teach him and show him. But the most important thing in all of that is that just like Elijah had to have a word from God before he ever went and anointed Elisha. I want you to know that I believe with all of my heart, our pastor had a word from God before he ever, before he ever moved toward passing that mantle on to Pastor Kevin. And I so trust that. And I, and I rejoice in knowing that we've done this right. I am so blessed and I, and I can so look forward to the future that God has for this body because this transition has been a meaningful and right transition. It has fit into this generational exchange that we're supposed to be a part. And this transition isn't about anything other than Pastor Ronnie's ceiling becoming Kevin's floor. He has pushed him forward and he has brought him to this time because God has told him to do that. And you know what? There is such great peace and anticipation in knowing the mantle is passing in this way. Yes, we're going to grieve for the passing of Elijah because we love him. We love him. And so many of us in our walk with Pastor Ronnie could easily say, Father, so many of us can do that. But you know what? The journey continues, and God has a plan. He has a plan for them the next season. He has a plan for this body in this next season, and we can trust what he's going to do with this mantle. Let me see if I can remember this. A mantle of great beauty you've placed upon us, Lord, it's a cloth without an equal, at a cost we'd never afford. <laughs> Holy in conception, within its depths a plan, creative splendor dwells within, beyond the skill of man. So throw wide its wings and watch it flame with life to share with each, as whispering through the threads the cry, first learn, my child, then teach, <laughs> then teach. Yours for now, this raiment fits upon your shoulders well. But listen close when it's time to pass. The cloak will surely tell. So throw wide the mantle and teach well its gifts to those who know the call. For one day when you fly away, upon their shoulders it must fall. Praise team, Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, for the way that you move us into and out of transition. I thank you, Father, for the plan that you have had from the very beginning. I thank you for hearts that are willing to listen and to step into the things that you have for us. Father, it is with anticipation and praise, Lord, that we move forward into the next season of this journey and the, and the calling that you have on this house. And Father, we pray blessing, blessing upon our pastor as we move forward, blessing upon both of them, Lord in this passing of the mantle. You are faithful and you are good and we can trust you. We love you, Lord. Yes, 